We now move to question time and I call Senator Cadell. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. How much more will an average Australian household be paying in electricity and other costs this financial year? Thank you, Senator. Um, Minister. A lot less than you. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President, and I thank Senator Cadell for the question. It does. Uh, I can say that they, uh, with the implementation of the Powering Australia plan, which we have in this budget, $21.9 billion, going on to fix the energy mess, fixing the energy mess of 10 years of denial and delay, 22 policies, none of them landed. None of them landed. With the investments that we are making in the um, in Powering Australia that we will be putting downward pressure on energy prices over time. This is why this work has become more urgent, more urgent, more urgent than ever. We need to put all Order. of our effort into implementing Order. these policies and making sure that we are fixing the grid, getting more renewable energies into the system so that we actually support, have a government that supports the energy transformation that is needed, that was denied the Australian people by the former government. And this challenge is the one that is perhaps most urgent in terms of our economy, in terms of cost of living pressures on households, on businesses. We understand that. Now, the budget has forecast, the budget has forecast increases in both gas and electricity or expected increases in gas and electricity prices over the next year. Senator Depending Kim. on which state or territory you are in, the impact of that will differ, but we do acknowledge that it is a significant impost on households and businesses. In the ACT, for example, where we have 100 per cent renewable energy, prices between 2021 and 2022 are going down. That is the reality because renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. We understand that, and Senator that is exactly Hume. why we need to put more effort in cleaning up the energy mess that you guys left Thank behind. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Madam President. I note the Minister's inability to say how much more Australia, average Australian household would be paying in electricity and other costs. I refer the Minister to NAB's Consumer Sentiment Survey, which says that by Christmas, Consumers expect an increase of 33 per cent for grocery costs, an increase of 52 per cent in fuel costs and an increase of 31 per cent in utilities costs. Minister, do these expectations reflect the reality of the price hikes Australians can expect? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. Well, I'm sure those opposite are reading um, and understanding the inflation challenge that is uh, alive and well across the Australian economy. Uh, and and uh, yes, we have an inflation problem that we are not seeking to exacerbate with this budget. The Reserve Bank, the Reserve Bank, is making uh, is increasing interest rates in order to put downward pressure or to reduce inflation and get it back to within normal range. The government took the very responsible decision in this budget to make decisions that did not make the work of the Reserve Bank any harder. That is, the easiest thing to do would to be to, to say that we could um, you know, spend some of the upgrades that we got in terms of revenue. That would be the easiest thing to do. But what we did was bank 99 per cent of that and put our, where we did provide additional spending and putting it into services that did not increase the inflation problem in this country. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator Cadell, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. With Australian households already hurting under Labor and their promise to cut electricity prices by $275 already broken, will the minister guarantee that they will at least keep their promise to deliver all of the legislated income tax for Australians earning more than $45,000? Or will Australians face being slugged with higher taxes as well as higher costs under Labor? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Well, the government uh, keeps all of our promises. Um, yeah. That is. <laughs> Minister, resume your seat. Order. 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 All senators on my left, 
Order. Senator Henderson. Senator Scar. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Ayres. I should not have to repeatedly call out order. When you become that loud, the obvious response from the president is going to call you to order. And when I call you to order, I expect quiet. Minister, please continue. Thank you. And you'll see that in at the budget that we handed down two days ago. And I know that is funny to those opposite. And I know that it is a foreign concept to those opposite that you'd actually have a government minister, that does what it says. Um, Senator McKenzie, you don't. That was very disrespectful, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Mackenzie, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Point of order yes. on relevance, and I don't know if it is because the finance minister didn't hear the question that question um, Senator Cadell asked, but it was actually about broken promises. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Order. The minister has only just started her response. I've had to call the Senate to order twice because it's very hard to hear. Uh, I do believe she's being relevant, but I can assure you, if she's not, I will draw her back to the question. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Thank Minister. you, President. And I acknowledge that it is a foreign concept for those opposite that you would actually, in government, do what you said Senator you would do, McGrath. deliver on your commitments you make, and that's what this budget does, on cheaper childcare, on cheaper medicine, on renewable energy, on delivering all of our commitments. You see them in the budget, ending the waste and rorts. We're doing that. Budget repair, we're doing that. Not adding to the inflation challenge, we're doing that. And we're still delivering on hospitals, on aged care, on NDIS, Senator all McGrath. of these areas that have Senator been neglected Birmingham. for years. We are fixing it up, and this budget is a sign of our commitment to deliver Thank on what we your promised. Time has expired. Our Senator White. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please inform the Senate how women have been placed at the centre of the Albanese government's budget? Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator White for the question uh, and um, the, her long-standing interest in uh, women's policy and gender equality. In fact, every, all, of, uh, all of those that sit on this ben these benches uh, the commitment around achieving gender equality in this country. After a decade of neglect by the previous government, our government is committed to putting gender equality at the core of our budget and unlocking the valuing, the talent, potential and contribution of women in Australia. We're investing $4.7 billion in cheaper childcare. This will make it cheaper and easier for 96 per cent of families to access early childhood education support workforce participation, especially by women. We're providing $531 million to expand the paid parental leave scheme up to 26 yes. weeks, which is something, yes. another one of these national schemes that Labor built and Labor is making even stronger. We're investing $1.7 billion to improve women's safety initiatives to support our ambition of a country free from gender-based violence in a generation. These measures form just part of our $7 billion investment in this budget to drive gender equality. These are our first steps, President. We will also deliver a national strategy to achieve gender equality within our first year of government to provide vision and direction about how we can achieve gender equality in Australia. And I look forward to working with all of my colleagues in doing that. We had a great um, event this morning. Uh, launching the women's budget statement, which has remember when that got cancelled by Minister Abbott, the Minister for Women, uh, when that was cancelled, we put that back in place and we've made it a document of substance. Uh, and that is what we will continue to do because this is a government that takes achieving gender equality seriously. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator White, first supplementary. Thank you for that fantastic answer, Minister. Can the uh, Minister outline the government's commitment to reinstate gender responsive budgeting? Minister. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Senator White, for the question. Unlike the previous government, women are not an add on in this budget, they are at its core. And decisions that the government makes when we make them are informed by gender analysis about how those decisions affect women. We're putting gender equality at the heart of decision making by reintroducing gender responsive budgeting 
after it had previously been abolished by the co coalition government. But it was something that we tried to keep up in opposition, and I pay credit to our colleagues, um, Tanya Plibersek, Sharon Claydon, the Status of Women Committee, who worked tirelessly in opposition with no resourcing and very little time to assess to us do the assessment that's now being led by the public service uh, that we did in opposition. And it was important because it sent a message that we take gender responsive budgeting seriously, and you see that reflected in the women's budget statement that was released on Tuesday night. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, second supplementary. Can the minister explain why advancing gender equality is an economic and social imperative? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator White for the question. Unfortunately, Australia currently ranks 43 out of 146 wow. countries in the World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap wow. Index. This is where we are today. Our gender pay gap stands at 14.1 per cent. It's higher for First Nations women. It's not good enough, and we know that we cannot call ourselves a fair country while one half of the population is paid less, does more unpaid care and experiences much higher rates of domestic, family and sexual violence. Driving gender equality isn't just good for women, it's also good economic policy. This was a resounding message from our Jobs and Skills Summit, where one of the first outcomes of that meeting was that women's economic equality must be treated as a key economic imperative, that it was crucial to the future of our economic prosperity that we deal with that, that way. And we've listened to that, and that's why I'm proud of this budget, which places Thank women you, Minister, at the centre. Your time has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you. My question is also to the Minister for Women and the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. I note you just boasted in previous question about your support for women, but during the election, Labor matched the coalition's commitment to subsidise the cost of assisted reproductive technology services for aspiring parents diagnosed with cancer or at risk of passing on a genetic condition. Yet this commitment has been shelved in the budget to achieve a savings benefit. Has the Albanese government broken their promise to aspiring parents in need of IVF support? Thank you, Senator Askew. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Uh, not at all, um, President. And I would say that the, um, the budget also includes, I think, almost $70 million from memory for women's uh, health initiatives. Um, the Assistant Minister, Jed, uh, Minister Ka uh, Carney, is actually leading the work on a women's health uh, strategy. She's been doing a lot of work and consulting uh, with various stakeholder groups. But this, this budget is a proud budget in terms of the investments in health. Investments in health, in hospitals, in primary care, um, in Mr. Medicare. Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, point of order, Madam President. Uh, I think you note that the question was specifically around a particular budget measure that is missing from the budget in relation to IVF for women and parents who have been diagnosed with cancer or genetic conditions. Uh, there has been you, no Senator mention Rustin. whatsoever you, of that Rustin. measure. I don't need the commentary. I do believe uh, the minister is being relevant. She has been talking about women's health. Um, and if not, I will direct her to the question. Minister Gallagher. I think it was about our commitment, and I, I answered the question right at front. And I said, no, should not, we have not. Um, I, I didn't agree with the proposition that was being put by Senator Askew, and I was going on to explain the investments that we are making in uh, women's health and the work that is being done to actually put together a strategy around it, um, because we take this seriously. We understand that women's reproductive health is uh, key to women's health overall, and that has obviously flow on uh, impacts into our economy and our community. So that is the point I'm making. I'm also making the point that we have a very positive investment in health, in dealing with some of the challenges, again, surprise, surprise, that we were left by a former government that had spent nine we years trying to dismantle Gallagher, Medicare please. and not invest Minister, in health measures. In your seat. Uh, you have a minister, you have a senator on her feet. Order. Uh, order. Order. I've called uh, the opposition to account three times. I called order. You had one of your senators' front benches on her feet. 
Min uh, Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Uh, once again, on a uh, matter of relevance, um, the question referred specifically to a budget measure in relation to people who have cancer or genetic conditions in relation to IVF. She has not answered well, that Senator question. Rustin, as you know, I can't direct. I can't direct the minister to answer the question in a way that might uh, be your response. But I do believe, for the second time, that the minister is being directly relevant. Um, Minister. <laughs> Minister I've asked, well, are you having another question? Are you having another question? Because that wasn't the question. I, I have answered the question that was put. I, I've Order. answered the question that was put to me uh, straight up, and I'm now going on to explain the other positive measures in the budget, including a including measures around women's health. It's a positive budget for women. It's a positive budget for health. It's dealing with a decade of delay and... Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, once again, on relevance, and, uh, and I respect your decision here, um, President, mm -hmm. but the minister has not answered the question despite saying that she has, and I would ask you to direct her to actually answer the question. Uh, in my opinion and my ruling, uh, Senator Wong. President, um, before, if I may, before your ruling, uh, I'd submit that if uh, Senator Rustin had been paying attention, I think the minister had actually responded directly to that point, the specific policy point, in her first uh, few sentences. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 well, and. Order. 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 I'm very happy for you to spend as much time on this if you, as you wish. <laughs> uh, uh, and we're always happy to have our record on health matched up against yours, but that's a different point. Uh, Order. 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 Senator McGrath. Order. I should not have to name senators to call you to order. Now, my ruling is once again, I do believe the minister is being relevant. Minister Gallagher, do you? Okay. Um, Senator Askew, first supplementary. Thank you. During the election, Labor matched the coalition's commitment to fund 20 new Gidget Foundation Australia perinatal mental health and wellbeing services in every state and territory yet the budget only provides for 12 services across Australia. Has the Albanese government broken their promise to new mothers in need of mental health and wellbeing support as well? Thank you, uh, Senator. Ask you, Minister. Uh, thank you. No, this budget delivers on the commitments that we made. Uh, and we'll, well, it does. It does. You're even accepting that it's in the budget, that it's in the budget and they will be delivered, OK? Um, well, order. Is this like 20 questions in one? Uh, sorry, President. It's just I get asked one question and then I get another 10 questions being well, given to me. That, but I would direct people. I I would be directing people. Minister, please yeah, resume. I would your, please sorry. resume your seat. Order. 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 Senator McGrath, order. Order. I'm waiting for quiet. Senator Askew has asked a first supplementary, which the minister is endeavouring to answer. You may not like her answer, but at this point she is still being relevant, and it is not helpful for you, any of you, to be parroting across the chamber other numbers. If you have a question, speak to your side about getting on the list. But I'm requiring the minister to answer the question that's before her, and that is the answer. That's the question from Senator Askew. Please, Minister, continue. Thank you. And um, thank you, President, uh, for your protection there. Um, the government will be delivering. The oh, 
Well, can I please answer it? The government will be delivering on our health commitments that we made in the election campaign. My, well, and if you look at budget paper two, uh, which goes through the measures, you will see page after page of investment in health, particularly in areas. In particularly in uh, areas. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Right. Senator Askew, second supplementary. So the Albanese government has shelved or cut two of your key women's health commitments from the election. Will you apologise to new mothers and aspiring parents in need of support for prioritising other spending areas over Senator your commitments Wong. to them? Senator Wong. Oh, Senator Wong. Senator McGrath. Order. 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 Uh, Minister, thank you. Second supplement. Well, I'm not about. To, well, I'm not about to accept a lecture from those opposite about women and services for women. Okay, and if you look in this budget, it is a good budget for women. If you read Budget Paper 143, you will see where we. Budget Paper 2, page 143. You will see that we have delivered on the commitments we've made and indeed surprise surprise we're going to also do some work on evaluation of initiatives to make sure that they are delivering the support to the communities that those programs are intended and that is good responsible budgeting that is exactly the approach that I will take as finance minister we deliver on things we also evaluate to make sure that they are delivering the support and the programs that are intended by those measures Thank you, Minister. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Watt. Private schools funding across the Ford estimates will now be $1.7 billion more than the amount the previous government committed in their final budget. Does the Minister believe that throwing even more money at private schools at a time when public education is in dire need of support is a fair thing to do? Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Uh, I speak to you as a proud product of the state education system in Queensland, uh, as is my wife, as are both of our children. But as I have often said in the past, I equally respect the right of families to choose the schooling environment that is appropriate for their families. Uh, for my family, uh, the appropriate choice was a state school environment. For other families, it's a Catholic or independent school. So we, um, poor old Jared hasn't got over his prejudices uh, about Senator GPS White, schools, it would helpful. appear, but you know, some of us move on and grow, grow in life, and some of us stay at about grade six level, uh, like Senator Rennick. Um, um, Senator but, Watt, I would ask you to withdraw that comment, please. <laughs> Senator Watt, I'm asking you to withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you. Please, is that the art? Have you finished? Or the, uh, but as I say, we respect the choice of families uh, as to the appropriate uh, schooling environment for their children, and that's why we're providing funding for, for both state and non-sector schooling environments. Uh, some of the things that we uh, have delivered in this budget, for instance, $270.8 million over two years for the school upgrade fund. Uh, $56.2 million for bursaries to attract more high achievers um, into teaching, $68.3 million to expand the high achieving teachers program, $27.6 million for other measures to tackle teacher shortages and better prepare student teachers for the classroom, 203 Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Orman Payne. Uh, point of order on relevance. The question was directed to whether or not funding private schools at a higher level than public schools is fair. Thank you, uh, Senator Orman Payne. And I will remind uh, Senator Watt of the question. Please continue, Senator Watt. Um, thank you, President. And just to provide a bit more further detail on funding for different sectors, the, in 2022, the Australian government is providing $25 billion in recurrent school funding. Uh, the majority of the, the largest amount is to government schools, $9.94 billion. $8.64 billion for Catholic schools, $6.67 billion for independent schools. Now, I will check this, but my understanding is that the 
uh, the increasing to non-state schooling in this year's budget is, I understand, and again I'll check this, is a result of the indexation model that already exists uh, and has applied for some time. Uh, but I run Thank out of time. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Orman Payne, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. As a proportion of total funding, private school funding is growing, according to the budget, and funding for public schools is shrinking. Does the minister accept that the government's budget has moved Australia even further away from reaching 100 per cent of the minimum schooling resource standard for public schools? Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Uh, minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Senator Orman Payne, as I was saying, um, one of the factors that influences the amount of funding that's provided to different schooling sectors in every budget is the indexation model. Another factor that, that influences it uh, is the number of enrolments in particular sectors. Uh, we are in the process of beginning a new schools funding agreement with the states and territories, which will consider a wide range of matters, including the indexation uh, of, uh, of school funding. Uh, but I might point out that in electorates that are represented by the Greens, such as Brisbane, Griffith and Ryan, there are, subs are a substantial portion of families who choose a non-state schooling environment for their children. Uh, and uh, and we, we strongly support the rights and, and interests of, of public schools. Uh, and as I say, I've reflected that in my own personal decisions. Uh, and, but we also respect the need for some level of funding for private schooling as well. Thank you, Senator Watts. Uh, Senator Orman Payne, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Is the minister aware that the King's School, a private school in New South Wales, plan to use funds to build their head teacher a private plunge pool? Is the minister also aware that there has been around a 45 per cent increase in demountables from 2014 in 2020 in New South Wales public schools? Does the minister believe that it is fair that a Labor is giving even more money to private schools while the public system crumbles? Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Watt. Um, thank you, President. I am aware of those reports involving, uh, I think it was the King's School, uh, and I think it is important for all independent schools uh, to be accountable for the public funding that they receive and to make good decisions about how that funding is used. Uh, I don't think that taxpayers would expect public funding to be used uh, for inappropriate purposes. They are intended to be used for what goes on in classrooms, and I'd certainly encourage all private schools to approach funding that way. There is no doubt that state schools in Australia need more, more public funding. Uh, they've needed it for at least the last 10 years that the last government was in power, uh, and these are matters that we will consider further with the states and territories as we approach a new schools funding agreement. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister outline to the Senate what the Albanese Labor government is doing to clean up the mess left by the Liberals and the Nationals to get the NDIS back on track? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, President. And uh, I thank uh, Senator Urquhart for her question and her deep uh, interest in this uh, area of policy. Uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is a great Australian success story. It's a scheme that exists only because of a Labor government. And the NDIS is a scheme that will be protected by a Labor government. The NDIS is an essential investment <coughs> that supports those people living with disabilities and their families. <coughs> the NDIS provides support for over a half a million Australians with significant uh, and permanent disability. Despite this, the Liberal and the National Party, through active disinterest, left the NDIS to wither on the vine during their long nine years of mismanagement and neglect of this uh, um, position. They, they failed to do anything about cost increases, instead kicking the can down the road, as they did with so many difficult uh, issues. Um, they shuffled seven ministers through the portfolio over a decade and broke trust with the people with the disability uh, sector. And they let uh, fraud and criminal activity sneak into the NDIS. Labor is committed uh, to putting people with disability at the centre of this scheme. And by establishing an independent review, 
led by a panel of experts and people with disability, the, uh, the, the uh, Albanese Labor government is starting to rebuild this trust and get this scheme back on track. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Urquhart, first supplementary. Can the minister tell the Senate what the Albanese Labor government is doing to reduce fraud and criminal activity in the National Disability Insurance Scheme? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Senator Urquhart, I can, because under the Liberal government, fraud and criminal activity became a significant contributor to waste in the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Under the watch of those opposite, this mob over here, yeah, over the, yep, that's Long them, time. there is evidence that the scheme has been targeted by serious organised crime. Currently, there are uh, $213.9 million of NDIS scheme funding being investigated for fraud. The uh, Albanese Labor government has zero tolerance for fraud and is committed to stopping the waste of NDIS participating uh, funding that should be used to give individuals choice over their lives. Earlier this year, the CEO of the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, Michael Phelan, noted that 15 to 20 per cent of the Senator scheme's Carroll, funding time has could expired. be— Senator Urquhart, um, second supplementary. Can the minister explain to the Senate how the establishment of the Fraud Fusion Task Force will restore integrity and responsible economic management in the Dis National Disability Insurance Scheme. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Urquhart for her insightful question. Yes, I can uh, explain the answer to that question. Um, the Albanese Labor government made an election commitment to restore trust in the NDIS and ensure a better future for Australians living with disability. The establishment of a fraud fusion task force complements this uh, commitment by strengthening fraud detection and better safeguarding the National Disability Insurance Scheme from serious organised crime and other fraud. The Fraud Fusion Task Force will better enable intelligence sharing, identification and response by the, uh, the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguards Commission, uh, Services uh, Australia, other departments, law enforcement agencies and regulators. The Australian Government will continue to investigate and prosecute to the full extent of the Thank laws Farrell, those the found to be committing has fraud. Now expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Gallagher. Oh, yeah, sorry, didn't see you. <laughs> um, Minister, the budget reinstated Medicare item 288. We wanted item 288 reinstated, but Tuesday's budget measure doesn't go far enough. It only applies to video conferencing. What are you doing to support people who don't have access to video conferencing and can't attend an in-person appointment? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question and for a heads up on the question so that I could um, uh, get some advice from the Minister's office. Uh, I understand that the Minister for Health, uh, Minister Butler, has been engaging with the Jackie Lambie Network on this matter and will continue to do so. And um, on the 6th of October, the Department of Health and members of the Minister's office um, met with um, the Jackie Lambie Network. I'm not sure if it was your office, Senator or Senator Lambie's, to um, have a discussion on these matters, and that will continue. On the issue of telephone consults versus video conference, um, this I think it is. It's hard to remember because of the, how intense the last few years have been, but. Um, Phone telehealth was, hasn't been an option that, that's been available uh, prior to the response to COVID-19. Um, and so I think there are, I think in my discussions with doctors, and I think this probably reflects the minister's um, under, or position too, that there is an accepted view that um, across the health workforce that face-to-face -face, um, and video services better support patient care and patient outcomes and should be the preferred form of consultation with patients, uh, particularly when there's items for more complex uh, care arrangements. And this is the case uh, particularly in long form consultations over 45 minutes. 
The government is committed to the evidence-based uh, care and telepsychiatry services consultations that are longer than 45 minutes should either be face-to-face -face or delivered via video conferences. But I accept the point about people uh, finding it difficult um, to, at times, get in front of video conferencing and can find it hard to access services. And I'm sure the minister's office will continue to talk about those, particularly in your local area. Uh, thank you, Minister. Sen Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. We all know elderly people find it hard to use Zoom. Well, not all of them, but some. Um, people in regional areas don't have good internet. Um, why is the government insisting on video conferencing? Surely, if it's a choice between the phone or nothing, you'd rather have people on the phone. Thank you, uh, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And, um I certainly accept that in areas uh, across the regions, and particularly where there's workforce shortages as well, which affects regional communities, that accessing healthcare services can be difficult. Um, there is a, a very strong regional communications uh, package in this budget, which goes to strengthening um, regional communities' access to uh, internet um, and um, at, at good speed. So that is part of it. But again, I think. The clinical preference is to have face-to-face, -face, in person or video presence for consultations, particularly for complex care, of which elderly, often geriatric or elderly care uh, falls under that uh, criteria. Uh, if there are other circumstances, you know, if there are other options available, I'm sure the minister will engage with you, recognising there are some particular challenges in Tasmania about accessing um, primary health care, essentially. We've got urgent care clinics Thank and... You, Minister. Your time Sorry. has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Sadly, she actually answered my third question in the second question, so I might just skip out of the third, and I know that's rare. Thank but you. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong, relating to consistency in funding allocations. I refer the Minister to the comments made by the Prime Minister in his budget reply speech last year that all projects must really stack up against the Infrastructure Australia model. When the Tasmanian Government requested support for an infrastructure project in Hobart, namely an AFL stadium, Mr Albanese said he wouldn't consider funding until he had received a business plan. Minister, if Tasmania can't get funded for a project without providing a business plan, why does the budget allocate $2.2 billion for a labour, labour pet project in Victoria that also doesn't have a business plan and, and which the Victorian Auditor General identifies as failing to demonstrate an economic rationale? Thank you, Senator Colbert. Minister Wong. Uh, th thank you. Um, President and I thank Senator Colbeck for the for the question and uh, I am uh, pleased to get a question about Tasmanian infrastructure because of course uh, Senator might be aware that in fact the Prime Minister with the Premier of Tasmania uh, and a former Senator Guy Barnett in fact announced Marinus Link uh, just just this last week uh, and uh, uh, Senator Wong please resume your seat Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. Uh, point of order on relevance. Uh, my, my question is about a Victorian infrastructure project that doesn't have a business plan and, quite frankly, doesn't stack up. Um, thank you, Senator Colbeck. Your question, which I took note of, was quite um, broad-ranging and had quite a long preamble. And You started off with talking about consistency in funding, but I will listen closely to uh, Minister Wong and direct her if necessary, but I believe she's started off being relevant, Minister. Uh, uh, well, I, I thank you, uh, President. I would make the point to the Senator, who seems to be implying in this question that uh, so, some, uh, some issue with funding Tasmanian infrastructure, and I'd make the point that there are quite a deal of infrastructure commitments that Tasmania is receiving under this government. And of course, at Marinus Link, which has been something Tasmania has been seeking for years, same seeding for years, uh, is being delivered uh, by partnership between the Albanese Labor government and the Liberal government in Tasmania, something the Senator Colbeck and in government could never deliver. I'd also make the point that the budget has included in it $540 million to upgrade the Tasman Highway, the Bass Highway and the East and West Tamar Highways, uh, in addition to other 
uh, investments. In relation to the sub suburban ra rail loop, uh, we've been here Order. for some days, um, uh, and Wong. we've had an Senator attempt Wong, by those. Sit down. Um, Senator Hume, you have a Senate. Senator Henderson and Senator Watt, we have a senator on his feet. Order. Order. Senator Watt. Um, senator Colbert. Just a moment. Senator Henderson, I've called you to order twice. You have a senator of your own side on his feet. Senator Colbert. Thank you, President. Uh, Point of order on relevance. My question was about the government process in allocating funding, and, the, no, and Senator Wong has gone nowhere near nearest. my question. Uh, in fact, I wasn't even re complaining about a funding of a project in Tasmania. I was talking about a project funded in Victoria. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. As I said in your first uh, point of order, that your question uh, had quite a long preamble on a number of um, issues. And I'm listening to Senator Wong, and I do believe she's being relevant to your question. Senator Wong. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy for Senator Colbeck to go back to Tasmania and explain to his constituents that he's actually asking about Victorian projects, not Tasmanians, and he didn't want to hear about Tasmanian projects. But that's a matter for him. I'm sure my Tasmanian Senate colleagues, uh, Tasmanian Senate colleagues will, will have something to say about that. But as I was saying, in relation to the suburban rail loop, we are honouring our election commitment to provide $2.2 billion towards early works for the suburban rail loop east. The detailed business and investment case ah. for suburban rail loop released by Victoria last year demonstrated a benefit cost ratio of up to 1.7. So that's $1.70 for every you, dollar Wong. invested. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Colbeck, our first supplementary. Thank you, President. My supplementary question to Senator Wong is uh, when the New South Wales government said it wanted support to raise the height of the Warragamba Dam to protect communities from floods, a project that is recognised as a state significant infrastructure, Mr Albanese said he would talk to New South Wales after their state election next March. Yeah. And so why do the people of New South Wales have to wait for flood mitigation support until after the state election in five months, when the Victorian sure. Labor Party can get $2.2 billion Order. just one month before a state election? Uh, thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. If I, I might just finish, if I may, because I was asked uh, about Infrastructure Australia. Suburban Rail Loop will still be subject to assessment by Infrastructure Australia. Uh, under the National Land Transport Act, I'm advised that the project uh, the project will also be subject to a rigorous assessment process between, uh, the uh, between the Commonwealth and Victoria, and we will respect these processes like any responsible government. In relation to Warragamba Dam, I am advised that the government is open to discussing the dam raising project with the New South Wales government in more detail. There is no current proposal before the federal government with respect to co-funding the dam. But I will say this. Yeah, we are not going to take a lecture about integrity and infrastructure from those opposite who use taxpayers' money, uh, funds as if they were their own, if they were own election slush fund. And the Minister for Colour-Coded Spreadsheets over there can shout all she likes, but everybody knows uh, thank what you, happened Senator Wong. on your, your time watch. Has expired. Uh, Senator Davey. Uh, point of order, um, Madam President. Um, the minister was directly uh, referencing my colleague here on this side of the chamber instead of addressing through the chair and should withdraw. Um, yes, I will remind Senator Wong to refer to uh, all senators by their correct titles. Um, Senator Colbeck, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. Why are the people of Tasmania and New South Wales being punished by hypocritical and partisan decision making by the Albanese government? which clearly favour their Victorian Labor mates, as demonstrated by Mr Albanese throwing $2.2 billion of federal money at a Victorian project that the Victorian Auditor-General describes as failing to demonstrate an economic rationale. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you, um, President. Well, I have responded to the suburban rail loop 
project questions. I have also responded to the Warragam Badam questions. I'm now asked about partisan decision making. Can we remember the $15 million commitment for a car park at Balaclava Station, despite the fact that the land was already set aside for public housing? Can we remember $115,000 per space for a project in the Melbourne suburb of Berwick, which the Auditor General found was nearly three times the benchmark price? Can we remember 11 projects worth $175 million with no assessment work? Keep asking us about partisan infrastructure funding because we are not going to forget what you did. Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Brockman. Se uh, Madam President, uh, a point of order on direct relevance. Clear rulings from previous presidents have stated that a, including order. the last order. president, uh, but previous presidents of both persuasions have ruled that whilst passing glances at the opposition are acceptable, an answer, which is now more than halfway through, that has contained uh, nothing you, but Brockman. attacks on the opposition you, is irrelevant. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Order. 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 Senators, seriously, all of you, on my left and my right, it took me a very long time to get the attention of Senator Wong to ask her to sit down because there was so much disorder in this chamber that it wasn't possible. Thank you, Senator McGrath. You are the biggest offender and I would ask you to be quiet and respectful. Senator Colbeck's second supplementary was very broad and went to a, a hypocritical uh, question about why something was favoured over another. It was not specific, and I believe that Senator Wong is being, response, is being directly relevant. Thank you, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. And I acknowledge, I'm afraid I did not hear you, uh, and uh, had I heard, I would have responded more quickly. But I did see Senator Brockman and sit down. Uh, I have responded on the specific projects in question, but I would remind those opposite that their record when it comes to partisanship uh, uh, and poor process in infrastructure is well, is well there for all Australians to uh, see. Time. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. My question is for, is for the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Wong. Minister, the Australian energy market operator released a report which concludes that the closure of the little coal-fired power station will increase electricity prices even further next year. Now, Australian families are already struggling to pay their power bills and they are reeling, Minister, from the news in the budget this week that power prices are set to increase by 56 per cent. Now, given the experts are now revealing that the closure of coal-fired power stations increase people's power bills, will the government commit to keep the little coal-fired power station open to give Australian families costs of living relief who are struggling right now, Minister. Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President, and thank you to Sen the Senator for his question, Senator Babette for his question. And uh, There is no doubt that the uh, problems in the energy grid, and in particular the exiting of supply, which has occurred over the last nine years, is one of the factors contributing to higher energy prices. One of the factors. Uh, and I know that Senator may have a different view about this, but it is very clear from advice from energy market operators, from advice from energy market suppliers, that the cheapest form of new energy is renewables. Now, I know those opposite, in particular, have such difficulty with that, and their difficulty with it has contributed to the mess and chaos uh, that we see in energy markets in this country to date. Uh, and I know that the senator uh, is concerned, as, as we are, as all we all are, uh, by rising energy prices and the impact that has on family budgets. What and we Senator Rennick. 
Oh, I'll take the interjection from, Sen from the Senator opposite, Senator Rennick, who just asserted renewables are more, more expensive. Senator and that, Rennick. That, that falsehood that is, is, is one of the reasons why energy markets are in such a mess. Under you, four gigawatts exited of dispatchable capacity exited the system, and you put one gigawatt in. Now, though anybody who understands basic supply and demand knows that if you reduce, if you reduce supply, you're gonna, uh, there's going to be a f an effect on prices. So that is the case. So, Senator Babette, we may not agree on everything, but I do agree with you. This requires urgent attention. Order. We believe, on the basis of the the advice that from from the industry. So this is this. Oh. Please resume your seat, Senator Wong. This question is from Senator Babette. He is one of our crossbenchers. He gets very little opportunity to ask questions because it's on a shared basis. And I would ask all senators to give him the respect that he deserves, that his answer be heard in silence. Thank you, Senator Wong. Thank you. Now, uh, Senator Babette, I know that one of the things people seek uh, is a solution which may involve taxpayers putting in uh, subsidies to keep open. Uh, uh, facilities which are not commercial. What is, re what is really required is a transformation of our electricity sector so we get more supply, uh, put more supply into the system and transform the grid. Uh, thank, uh, Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, the Prime Minister, when asked about surging power bills this week, said that we're in this position because of the external factors like the war in Ukraine. How is it that a generation, Minister, after the Soviet Union was defeated, we are now so dependent on Russia or anyone else for our energy needs? Minister Wong. Uh, I, look, I think there are a number of uh, factors which are affecting uh, energy prices. Uh, Who did that? The, the point about... Uh, order. Order. Order on both sides. Order. I remind all senators once again, this is a question from Senator Bebet, and I would ask you to allow him to hear the answer, Minister Wong. Th thank you, uh, President. Uh, S Senator Bebet, Senator Bebet I, I think the effect of the illegal and immoral war in Ukraine uh, is not so much an effect on Australia alone, but an effect on global energy markets. Yeah. Uh, and what is occurring uh, is we have a, a number of factors which are affecting our energy market uh, and global energy markets and, of course, contributing to inflation. In relation to Senator our Rennick. energy markets, uh, we have, as I said, first... Uh, Senator Rennick, I've called you to order on a number of times. I shouldn't have to keep doing that. Uh, Senator Rennick, it's... It's not your opportunity to answer back. I've called you to order. I expect order. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the, the, uh, the war in Ukraine is affecting global energy markets. That is driving inflation, and it is also increasing energy costs. And if you speak... Oh, my God. Okay. Time's up. <laughs> oh, your time has expired, Senator Wong. As Senator Babbitt, second supplementary. Senator McKenzie. Order. Order. I have Senator Babette on his feet waiting to ask his second supplementary. Senator Thank Babette. you, President. This week, the Green German government has pulled down wind turbines, wind turbines to expand a coal mine across Europe. Coal-fired power stations are being reopened. And there are 300 new coal-fired power stations being built around the world right now. Why don't we join the rest of the world and build new coal-fired power stations so that Australian families, businesses, manufacturers can have cheap power bills once again and we can save our standard of living? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Well, uh, we share your desire that we ha to reduce energy prices. What I would say to you in relation to coal-fired power here in Australia is the market has not funded investment in new coal-fired power. The market has made a decision. So, I, look, I, I know that Senator Canavan wants taxpayers to fund up, but the market has chosen not to invest uh, in more coal-fired power generation because the market has made an assessment that renewables are cheaper. In relation to Germany, 
Uh, I am well aware of what is occurring in Germany. It, was a, uh, it has been a part of our discussion both uh, between the foreign minister and I, but also at the, at the foreign minister's meeting at the G20. Europe is doing the right thing, seeking to reduce reliance on Russian energy, and we support that. We support that because President Putin is looking to weaponise the, uh, the weaponise energy supply. So it is the right thing Senator to do Canada. for the European Union and, in particular, Germany, to look to make themselves more resilient in Thank the face you, of that weaponisation. Time has expired, Senator Giacconi. Senator Order. Order. Uh, Senator Ayres. Order on both sides. Senator Giacconi. Senator Wong. Senator Rennick. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Giacconi. Senator Gallagher. Order. Senator Gallagher, I'm waiting to call Senator Giacconi. Senator Giacconi. Thank you very much, uh, President. I appreciate that. It's a bit of a rowdy day today. My uh, question, President, uh, my question, President, um, is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Senator Penny Wong. Uh, Minister, how is the Albanese Labor government uh, making Australia a stronger? and much more influential uh, partner in a very contested world, particularly uh, what has arisen out of our commitments in the October budget earlier this week. Uh, could you also uh, um, please also uh, inform the Senate how the Australian government is building a stronger Pacific family? Uh, Senator Wong. Good. Excellent. Thank you. I uh, thank Senator uh, Ciccone for his question, and I thank him also for, uh, as chair of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, uh, I know he is uh, particularly interested in these matters, uh, which go to uh, ensuring Australia is safer and more secure in our region and in the world. Uh, so what I would say is you will see in this budget uh, the government's commitment to renewing our closest relationships uh, and the government's commitment to advancing Australia's interests and Australia's values. Uh, you will see in that budget, uh, consistent with what we have been doing since we are, were elected, uh, the work that the government is undertaking to make Australia a partner of choice for the part part countries of our region to assure Australia's security, to assure Australia's economic strength and to shape the world for the better. Uh, our, we, our intention is to do what we are able to help build a stronger Pacific family. We want to help our regional partners become more economically resilient, develop critical infrastructure and provide their own security so they have less need to call on others. The investments outlined in the budget include an additional $900 million over the next four years to support Pacific development and resilience. This follows a decade of Liberal cuts uh, which undermine the national interest. Uh, and that is the pity uh, of the approach that was taken uh, against Senator, uh, Ms Bishop's advice, uh, and I assume against Senator Payne's, but that's a matter for her, uh, by, by pre the previous government to reduce Australia's development assistance, because that, that was a reduction in Australia's influence in the region. So that develop, the, the additional ODA will and other measures will advance our interests by tackling poverty, supporting stability, Senator prosperity Star. and security in our region. Likewise, we are also intent on improving and expanding Pacific labour mo mobility to help Pacific economies still struggling with the aftermath of COVID. Thank you, Senator uh, Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. I thank uh, Minister Penny Wong for that uh, comprehensive answer. Oh, Senator what's Scar, wrong with come that? on. Senator Giacconi, continue your question, please. Senator Ciccone, please continue. Name. Order. Thank it's her name. Order. Senator Ciccone, please continue. Thank you very much, President. Um, could I also ask the Minister what steps is the government taking to deepen Australia's security cooperation uh, with our Pacific uh, partners in the region? Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, this, is, this is a very important uh, domain for Australia to continue its and deepen its engagement, and uh, I thank the, the Senator for recognising that. 
Uh, there are a number of measures in the budget which go to our commitment to supporting the security needs of our Pacific partners and giving life to uh, our commitment and our view that uh, security in the Pacific should be a, uh, an issue for the Pacific family. This includes the continuing AFP deployment in Solomon Islands in 2023, delivering and I would have thought some of this might have bipartisan support, really. I mean, I'm talking about um, an Order. AFP deployment Order. and you want, to, you want to interject on, a, on, a, on Australian Order. Federal Police deployment Order. that has bipartisan support. Order. Uh, delivering a new Australia Pacific Defence School to boost training for defence and security forces of the Pacific, across the Pacific and doubling funding for aerial maritime surveillance in the thank Pacific. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Giacconi, second supplementary. Oh, thank you very much, President. I again thank uh, Senator Penny Wong for that answer. Uh, how is the uh, Albanese Labor government's budget building a more stable, prosperous and resilient region? Minister Wong. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to talk, if I may, in the last minute about two, like, uh, two, two Pacific Island Forum members, uh, important members for us. Uh, the first is uh, Cook Islands, uh, the incoming chair of the Pacific Island Forum, uh, and I thank them for their hospitality last week. Uh, whilst I was there, I signed the o Oa to Manava partnership with Prime Minister Brown, which paved the way for deeper cooperation between our two countries. Uh, Cook Islands, as I said, is the incoming chair of the forum. Uh, we have elevated our engagement with the Pacific Island Forum as the key regional architecture uh, uh, within the Pacific. Uh, it is one of 11 countries which I have had the privilege of visiting since my appointment as foreign minister. In relation to Fiji, I just would like to inform the Senate uh, that we are building on our new status of forces agreement between Fiji and Australia, signed by the Deputy Prime Minister and his counterpart last week. Uh, that marks an important milestone in our defence relationship Senator Wong. with Your Fiji. Time has expired. Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. of all answers to, to all, right. all questions from, from coalition senators. And I would like to start with talking about infrastructure and how, how Labor are gutting rural, regional and remote Australia. And it is terrible what they are doing, because what, what the Labor Party are doing, they've got a giant vacuum cleaner, a giant vacuum cleaner over rural, regional and remote Australia, and it's, and it's sucking all the money out of that and it's sending it to Marrickville, because that's where the money is going. I want to talk about some projects in Queensland, because we've got some Queensland Labor senators who think they know about, about regional Queensland. I want to talk about some projects. Let's talk about the dam um, in Etheridge Shire Council at Forsyth. Uh, the Charleston Dam, which I want to be renamed the Nolly Nyken Dam, by the way. $10 million of money went into this dam through the Building Better Regions Fund. $10 million. But according to Labor, this is a rort. That $10 million building that dam allowed the people of Forsyth and Georgetown to have drinkable water. But according to you know, drinkable water. Because until then, in summer, what would happen is they would, they would get water out of, out, of, out of the river that was dry and they'd be drinking sludge. Because that's what Labor want regional, rural, remote Australians to drink. That is sludge. Because that is what Labor give to, to regional Australians. But we, we deliver. So that dam means there is potable water for the people of Etheridge Shire Council. But let's also talk about, let's talk about uh, Merway Shire Council and a little place called Morven, which none of these buggers have ever been to. Uh, Morven has a population of about 100, and we've put some money into some cattle yards. They don't care about that because, according to Labor, their food comes from the fridge at Coles or Woolies or IGA or whatever organic fruit shop they happen to be going to on that day. But this is so important for that community because two jobs, two jobs come out of those cattle yards. That means a pub has been rebuilt in Morven. If you go to Morven now, there is a new pub there. So important for the sustainability of a small rural community. That is what the Building Better Regions Fund has done for Queensland. It is ensuring that those people who live beyond the Great Dividing Range, conflict of interest, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, I'm one of those people. It means, and so Senator Davey, it means that those Queenslanders and those Australians, they can have the quality of life that people in the cities take for granted. And that's why infrastructure is so important. That's why 
Jane McNamara, the mayor of Flindershire Council, fought fought like a really and she won't she probably get cranky right, like a really right. like a great tiger, a great lion. To make sure to, to, she got millions of dollars through the Building Better Regions Fund to build a lake in Hewenden. And you might think, oh, so, so what? What about a lake in Hewenden? It means that the people who live in Hewenden, which is a remote little, little, little township, they have a recreational facility where people can go fishing, they can walk around, they can have a life. Because one thing COVID has shown us is it is the benefit of living outside the cities. And this is why this budget is such a letdown for all Australians because of the abolition of the Building Better Regions Fund and also the partisanship that has come through the politics. It is really interesting how Labor are happy to give $2.2 billion to, 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 um, to Daniel Andrews to help his re-election, but they're not prepared to give little grants of money to little regional communities, a little community like Wandai. Now, the Bob over there don't know where Wandai is, you know, what Wandai's a beautiful little community. And one guy got about fifty thousand dollars for for the art gallery there. And the, the mob over there think that you know they're the artists, artists, they're, they're the artists of, of 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 politics. But it's our side. It's our side who stand up for regional art galleries. It's our side who stand up, who understand that Elaine Medill, who is the doyen of the Wandy Art Gallery, fought like another tiger, like another tiger, oh, fought to get fifty thousand dollars to rebuild the kitchen for the Wandai Art Gallery. But according to Labor, that's a raw, that's a, that's a terrible thing. Well, I'm going to say to Elaine, I'm going to say to Jane, and I'm going to say to the people of the Etheridge Shire Council, this, this side of politics will always fight for all Australians, but will particularly fight for rural, regional, remote Australians, because we know you're doing it tough. We know that you are the engine house of, of the Australian economy, and we know that more money should be spent on your roads, more money should be spent on, on your bridges, and more money should be spent on dams. And this is, this is the damning indictment of this government of what they are not doing in relation to the Urana Dam. A brilliant dam that is going to have um, a hydro pump that's got everything going for it. But this mob here have taken the money away from it and going to let this dam sink because this mob don't believe in dams because they need preferences from uh, the pixies at the other end of the political spectrum uh, to, to ensure they get re-elected each time. So shame on Labor for that because dams means money and money means we can do more for all Australians. Uh, Senator Mc uh, order. Senator McGrath, I'd like you to withdraw your use of the term "you buggers." I withdraw um, "you buggers." Oh, sorry, I withdraw. Sorry, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, you know, it's hilarious. If anyone was new to the conversation here, you think that these uh, 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 pill pillars of virtue and, and 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 everything good about Australia had an argument, but Mr. Deputy President, I mean, seriously, you had nine years, you mob. Nine years. Seriously, what the heck did you do for nine years? It's fantastic to talk about all these so-called great nation-building projects. You didn't fund them. You didn't, you didn't make any effort to build them. And we have to say a few things here. Mr Deputy President, please indulge me because it's been very wide open in question time today. And they, talk, they, no, they really talk no. some serious uh, uh, nonsense over that side. And, and you know, in, when we talk about infrastructure, and I've been tied up in the infrastructure portfolio through the Senate estimates now for uh, over 17 years. And I have to, yeah, I know, I don't know what I did wrong in certain parts of my previous life, but I, but I do remember a lot of stuff. But let me just say one thing seriously. How can we look at this side of the chamber in the opposition and see if there's any credibility? Let's talk about a certain project in infrastructure. And I bet it doesn't come up in Senate estimates from that mob over there this time around. Remember the Leppington Triangle? Remember that piece of land that was valued at $3 million? You know that piece of land at the end? Hey, listen to this. The new airport being built in Sydney. OK, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers, but guess what? It's this lot. They've got fingerprints all over it. $3 million it was valued at, owned by none less than an LMP donor, a well-known LMP donor. I'll take 25 steps out there. I don't need the protection of parliament to make this statement because it's damn true. You know what they bought it for under the Minister Barnaby Joyce, I think it was the Mr Joyce, I should say, Deputy President was the minister at the time. Three million dollar value? Did they pay three, three and a half? No. Did they pay five? You notice no one's interjecting over there? No. Did they pay six or seven? You know what they paid? You know what they took out of our pockets? All of us, all you out there in the gallery, all out you there in Radio Land? Thirty million dollars. 
Do I hear any objections? Where are the big voices on the opposition benches? Not one of them are saying boo. Now, there's some decent people on that side of the chamber, and I'm not accusing my good friend Peter, Senator Scar, who's got to fire up and take one for the team. Don't lay yourself, Senator Scar. You know you're better than that. But do I hear the nationals? There's a couple of nats on that side of the chamber. Very decent people. I've worked closely, very closely with a couple of them, and I look forward to working closely with them in Senate estimates for the next few days or few weeks. Do I hear any objection? Do I hear, still, you big mouth, you're telling lies? Well, 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 fancy that. $30 million. Now, Mr Deputy President, on a more serious note, I know there's a lot more that comes. Nine years, nine years of rotting and waste. And, and Senator McKenzie, oh, God, you've got to give it to Senator McKenzie. She, she got more front than Myers. And we remember her situation there when she got dumped as the minister for, what was it, the... Minister for colour coded sports rorts or board, uh, whiteboards or something like that, spreadsheets it was. But let me share another one with you, Mr. President. I oh, have Mr. Deputy President. It is very difficult on a serious note, and it's none of my business who the opposition chooses their leadership team. And thank goodness I don't get a vote in that madhouse. But I do struggle looking across the chamber, or looking on, not across the chamber, but on the televisions each night when I see. And I'm sorry, I don't know Miss Lee's seat, and I apologise, but I will say Miss Lee. And if anyone can tell me the seat, I'll refer to her as the member for uh, Farrah. Thank you very much, Senator uh, Davy, the minister for Farrah. You know, who was a government minister on a very attractive wage, very, very attractive remuneration, who was sacked from the ministry. And she was sacked from the ministry. And it's a well-known fact, ladies and gentlemen, very, very well-known, very well-documented. Eight. I think it was eight trips taxpayer funded to the Gold Coast. Oh no, I'm, I'm going to uh, love this one. Senator Stirl, I have a point of order. Senator Davey. Uh, I think you'll find that she resigned from the ministry. Uh, the um, shadow minister for industry and member for Farrah resigned from the ministry at the time. It's not, it's not she a was not point fired. There, David. It's a point of order, Senator Stirl. Please, if you're going to um, talk about another member of the Two chambers, please. Mr. Deputy Turn President, you know, back, it's, it's not gossip, it's not hearsay, it was well documented. The minister, all right, let's go with the minister resigned, okay? Because she used her taxpayers' dollars for eight trips to the Gold Coast to buy a unit on the Gold Coast from no less than I led to believe, if my memory serves me right. Now, let me see. It might have been a friend of her husband's or partner's, it may have been, who was an LMP donor. Now, seriously, you attack us, you come in here and you throw barbs about credibility nine years. No wonder the Australian public do not have faith in politicians and the political system. Can you, can you, can you dare, dare even think why I would be wrong? No, because that's the scene that was set on that side. Now, I can go on hour after hour, hour about the rorts, the $650-odd million Sir, dollar car park Sir. rorts. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. 24 hours after the budget, 24 hours after the budget, Labor is waving the white flag. Oh, no. They have the surrendered. They have surrendered on the fight to combat inflation. They have surrendered on their promises to generate wage growth. They have surrendered on providing cost of living relief to Australian families. They have surrendered on low unemployment. They have surrendered on low unemployment because the budget papers show 150,000 job losses. 150,000 job losses over the forward estimates. And then the audacity for the finance minister to say at question time that the government keeps all of its promises. The government keeps all of its promises. Well, the promise to keep inflation under control. The promise to keep employment low, the promise to provide cost of living relief, gone, disappearing. Why is it, why is it that the Treasurer Jim Chalmers can spend much of his commentary before the budget, his commentary in his budget speech, his commentary following the budget delivery, talking about the need to combat inflation, but has not taken one hard decision, not 
one hard decision to combat the scourge of inflation that is now bearing down on Australian families. As the weeks and the months progress, Australian families are going to have to face the very, very real economic challenges that no decisions taken by this government in its first budget, perhaps better characterised as a mini-statement, perhaps better characterised as an economic statement, no hard decisions to combat inflation. My colleague, Senator Cadell, from New South Wales, drew attention, great place, I'm sure it is, second only to Western Australia. Senator Cardell, in his question today, talked about the National Australia Bank Consumer Sentiment Survey. Let me share with you what the Consumer Sentiment Survey says. It says, higher consumer stress associated with the cost of living is now at its highest point since 2018. Consumer stress is now at its highest point since 2018. It says that cost of living pressures are resulting in consumers changing the way in which they spend. 61% of consumers surveyed are now switching to cheaper brands or shopping around for cheaper products. 54% of those surveyed said they were cancelling or cutting back on food delivery services and 47% of survey respondents said they were cutting back on entertainment. But there's more. The survey says a growing number have also cancelled or cut back other subscriptions like newspapers, magazines, audiobooks. People are now cutting back streaming services and gym, sports and club memberships. That is where the rubber is hitting the road. That is where the rubber is hitting the road and Australian families are now having to change their decisions because they are feeling the real impact of inflation. They know they must prepare for the worst, preparing for the worst because the government has failed to deliver on any real meaningful measure that will put downward pressure on inflation. And if there is a meaningful measure that the government can point to that is putting real downward pressure on inflation, then I invite them to nominate it. I invite them to nominate it. We've got Labor senators in the chamber now. I invite them to nominate it in their future contributions. So what does this mean for people's hip pocket? What does this mean for people's hip pocket? The consumer sentiment says consumers on average estimate, so this is consumers themselves, estimate that they will be paying around $239 in three months' time for groceries, when they're currently paying $180. The Consumer Sentiment Survey says fuel, where they're currently paying $67 a week, is expected to climb to $102 in three months' time. And for utilities like gas and electricity and water, consumers estimate they are currently spending around $244 per month, and this is expected to rise by $320. People deserve a better plan from this Labor government. Senator Billick. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise too in, uh, to take note, um, take note of questions asked. And I'm going to start because it was a bit of a confusion from, from my perspective today about what some of their questions were really about. Um, but I am going to start with the question from Senator Askew, who um, was asking about women's reproductive health um, and assisted reproductive technology. So it is true that we had to delay the commencement date of the assisted reproductive technology storage funding commitment. And it was delayed to the 1st of July 2023 because, and this is something that people really need to understand, because the measure cannot be delivered by the 1st of November 2022, the date originally announced by the former government. The delay will provide time to consult with the sector and develop the detailed administrative design of the measure. So we know with nine years of incompetence about from the, other, from the uh, former government, 
I was, I'm in a bit of a pickle about what I really want to talk about here today because, you know, electricity prices were also brought up today, and although I did speak about them yesterday or the day before, you know, we've got these, these issues where the government come, the opposition come in and they act as though they had no responsibility for anything that happened in the past nine years. And I know they were a pretty lazy government. I might know they were really good at announcements and they like power. They like power. I'm not talking about the electricity type of power they like. They like power for power's sake. But when it comes to electricity, when it comes to renewables, when it comes to things like climate change, they were just all over the place. I mean, in the past nine years, they had 22, 22 different um, policies on power, but they didn't impl implement them. I think they had nine ministers, if I'm correct. Um, no strategy, no real approach to anything except to make great big promises to people, to promise the world to everything, everyone. They, they were spending money like they were drunken sailors, seriously. And now we have to come in and clean up the mess. I mean, you don't have to be Einstein to work out, you know, if you're promising somebody, if I was to promise my granddaughter, you know, a $700,000 present and I didn't have $700,000, somewhere someone would have to help me clean up that mess. And that's what we're doing. We are cleaning up the mess of the previous government. And in regard to the health issue, just jumping back to um, Senator Askew's question, can I just say that the previous government neglected our health care system for the last nine years? Absolutely neglected it. You provided funding for pan cancer patients to access Medicare subsidised reproductive services, but you were all talk about it. There was no delivery. Typical of those on the other side. I know they haven't taken well to being in opposition. We understand that. They act like kindergarten children through question time because they cannot come to grips that they are no longer the government. I'm not sure how long it's going to take them to move from denial, but it's taking a bit longer in my books. Uh, they need to grow up a bit. They need to treat this parliament and this chamber and, in fact, the president with some respect. And they need to start taking responsibility. You know, it's, oh, oh, the Labor Party's done this. Oh, the government's done that. You had nine years. You did nothing. You did nothing. You and and when I think about it, you know, I think back to when um, Mr. Abbott um, was running uh, for one of the elections. I can't quite remember which election it was, but he said no cuts to education, no cuts to health, and then came in and like razor ganged the health area, as well as the education sector and others, you know, no cuts to pensions, just came in, took no account of what he had promised and just made the health area so Thank much Thank you, Senator Billick. Worse. Senator Cadell. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers to the uh, Coalition's questions, in particular ele electricity pricing and infrastructure. In April next year, the turbines at AGL's Liddell station in the Hunter Valley will spin for the last time. And with it, they take 1.2 gigawatts off the market. In 2025, Araring will also close, taking another three gigawatts of power off the grid. This is more than four gigawatts of lost energy, or 20% of the electricity in New South Wales, coming out in this term of parliament. These losses to the market will occur after an already predicted 56 per cent price rise in the budget. How high will electricity prices go after that? Who knows? It is clear that energy prices, just like petrol, just like interest rates, just like household bills, have no clear limit under Labor. When the campaign ad said it wouldn't be easy under this Prime Minister, maybe they should have said it's just going to be bloody tough. Under Labor, Everything is going to go up except your wages. 
Senator David Pocock spoke in this place about members in the gallery earlier who had chosen between heating and housing and asked Minister Farrell earlier what he would say to them. That minister said he would say hello and give them a wave. As useless as that advice was, it was perhaps a sign of what was to come in this budget. No care, no support or even a realisation of the burden that families are feeling across Australia. What did they get? A scrapping of Labor's promise to lower electricity prices by $275. That was repeated 97 times during the election. The ending of the petrol excise rebate. And now confirmation in the budget papers of massive rises in electricity prices over the coming years. Labor wasn't content with knocking a hole in the budget of the country. They were lining up mums and dads, our seniors, and putting a hole in their budget, Deputy President, Deputy President. In fact, to follow the lead of Minister Farrell, I might give you my own gratuitous advice to those in the gallery. 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. You are more likely to win the lotto with those numbers on Saturday than get a proper answer from this government about the steps they will take to lower electricity prices. Minister Gallagher stated that renewables are the cheapest form of electricity. But the more renewables enter the market, the more expensive our electricity becomes. Yep. On an energy project I was working in the Hunter to build grey hydrogen. Grey hydrogen made in, in an electrolyzer would cost me $2.90 a kilo. Green hydrogen, $9.40 a kilo. How are they cheaper? Reviewing the budget papers, I read that the price of thermal coal is expected to drop by $438 a tonne now to $60 a tonne. If this is the case, how are price prices meant to rise 50 per cent over that same time? Deputy Speaker, to quote the Muppets from Sesame Street, one of those things is not like the other. One of those things just doesn't belong. We then move to infrastructure. This quote from the Prime Minister. Labor will make sure those investments really stack up using the Infrastructure Australia model that I established as a minister. That was in his budget reply speech in March of this year. But just like the broken promise of $275 off bills, it seems Labor and the Prime Minister have broken another promise. We learnt that in the budget, those opposite are funding a suburban rail loop for the Andrews Labor government, a flagship commitment of the Andrews government. The Auditor General's report into the business case concluded that this project was neither sufficient nor provided in a timely manner on four of the projects it reviewed. Mr Deputy President, I go to three of the dates in the Auditor's report. The high-level problems and benefits articulated in the SRL business case lack necessary and supporting evidence. A narrow set of options were, consistent, uh, were considered and analysed both before and as part of the case, but they are not supported with comprehensive evidence, are not supported by detailed description or root causes of underlying drivers, and do not immediately point to the need for a transport-related intervention. If we were guilty of pork barrelling, this is a bacon box beyond belief. This is nothing more than buying votes for an unpopular Premier who locked people down and the rail loop should be spent more money letting people get out of Victoria and live their lives. Yeah. I'll put the, just give me a, please give me a moment. I'll put the question, uh, I'll put the question that the motion moved by Senator McGrath be agreed to. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Senator Ullman Payne. Thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of the answers given by the Minister, representing the Minister for Education, regarding Labor's funding for private schools. Figures from March 2020 show that approximately 12 per cent of classrooms in New South Wales public schools were in demountables. That represented a 45 per cent increase in demountables in New South Wales public schools from 2014 to 2020. Governments consistently tell us that while demountables may not be ideal, they're not the demountables of yesteryear and they actually offer decent amenities. Well, if demountables really aren't that bad, why not make them available to private schools instead of splashing ever increasing amounts of public money into ever more grand private school buildings? Why is it that public schools are always the ones that have to scrape by on scraps while the private sector gets more and more public funding? 
Gladswood Hill Public School in Sydney, a, re a relatively new school which opened its gates in 2020, by 2021 had 13 demountables taking over their open fields, leaving kids with nowhere to play. Nearby, Oran Park Public School had 27 demountable classrooms as of last year. Deputy President, school populations are exploding, but the government is chucking $70 billion over the next four years into the private system. Of course, the private education sector will tell us that capital funding and recurrent funding are separate streams. The reality is that that's complete rubbish. Every dollar of public money given to a private school by the government offsets the cost of teacher wages and other recurrent expenses directly related to educating students. It also frees up money that the private school would otherwise have to spend on educating students, allowing them to spend money on capital works. Yet despite the huge amount of money that governments provide to private schools, both in general funding and as capital works grants, the average independent school has raised their fees by over 50 per cent in the last decade and some as much as 80 per cent. So much for the idea that funding private schools relieves pressure on fee-paying parents. And so we see story after story of largesse from the richest private schools in Australia. Plunge pools for headmasters, trips to watch a rowing race in England, a 50-metre Olympic pool because their 25-metre one wasn't quite good enough for the water polo team. To be clear, I believe that Australian students deserve those sorts of amenities. I want to live in a country where school kids, no matter their parents' income, have access to pools, auditoriums, state-of-the-art theatres, technology and excursions. But when rich private schools, and I note that it is just the rich ones, many private schools do remain poor due to the decisions made by the Catholic and independent block grant authorities, when the rich private schools get public money while the public sector crumbles, that is a moral wrong. Private schools funding across the Ford Estimates Deputy President will now be $1.7 billion more than the amount the Morrison government committed in its final budget. As a proportion of total funding, private school funding is growing and funding for public schools is shrinking. The government's budget has moved Australia even further away from reaching 100 per cent of the minimum schooling resource standard for public schools, something that was suggested by Gonski over a decade ago. A greater proportion of federal funding for schools is now going to private schools, and that is worse than the Morrison government. Over $70 billion for private schools over the next four years, compared to only $45 billion for public schools. Labor has clearly given up on fighting for a fair education system. At a time when our public schools are in dire need of adequate resourcing and upgrades and are experiencing teacher shortages, this is not only incredibly disappointing, it's disgraceful. Well, the Greens won't give up on our public school students and teachers and we'll continue to fight for public money for our public schools. I put the question to in relation to the motion moved by Senator Orman Payne. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.